wish more people use the Windows Event Viewer and the Event Viewer system in general for their own level one diagnostics. The Windows Event Viewer does have a lot of stuff in it, but not all the stuff in it is useful and some of the stuff that should be in there isn't actually in there and I mean that's kind of the Microsoft MO, isn't it? It's like just overwhelm you and then maybe you won't notice the stuff that's missing. It looks like a lot, but we need to log a lot more. I'm gonna show you how and also what's missing and how we can put that back. Let's start with just the Windows Event Log vanilla. In case you're not aware, this is the Windows Log area. When things happen in Windows, it gets logged here. It's pretty interesting. Right click on the Start menu and go to Event Viewer. That's all you need to know. A lot of the resources online just talk about system, application, and security. There's a lot more under the hood. Under Applications and Services Log, oh, there's all kinds of stuff in there. And it's kind of overwhelming because most of these are actually empty. But if you use something like Remote Desktop to remote into your computer from another computer, uh, there is a log that's a little bit more buried under here that will log when you log in via Remote Desktop. And you don't necessarily see all the details for that in just application system and security. But what about if something is trying to log into Remote Desktop on your computer uh, just surreptitiously and that they're failing to log in? Well, that's not logged by default, or at least historically it hasn't been. But you can turn that on, and here's an article that talks about that and how you turn that on. But that's that's a big yikes, and I recommend that you update that. You know, you change the settings as outlined in that article. But Windows Event Log, that's sort of the, the microcosm of Windows Event Log, and that's what we're here to talk about. And also in a in a personal context, so hardware system under the hood, you get clues about what's going on with your hardware. I have a USB audio interface, and sometimes USB peripherals go wonky, and it makes me sound like a robot. Uh, USB can be so frustrating. Other times, USB just totally crashes and causes a blue screen of death because, because of course it does, because of inserting and removing a device can totally cause a blue screen, that's a thing. But that's another video for digging into blue screens and their sources and, and taking it apart from the event log perspective. But in the event log, you see a lot of events around the blue screen. And that's what we have here for the USB to crash and everything else. Now with hard drives, when they're starting to die, there might be some warning messages logged in the event log as well. Let's take a look at some recent messages from the source disk and see what we can find. This is a, maybe a more unsettling warning from disk. And again, you know, you sort of have to know an error was detected on device, a hard disk DR1. So you, you may have to use PowerShell or the disks you know, built in, right click and go to uh, system management, uh, computer management, and then disk management to figure out where DR1 is. Which one is that? I'm like, well, you're gonna have to do some digging. But uh, this is concerning because it says an error was detected on that during a paging operation. Paging operation means that it was swapping to uh, the page file. It means that it ran out of memory or something was, you know, low, priority and it tried to write it out to disk. The page file is one of the hottest files on your your SSD for writing. And then here it says, oh, the IO operational logical block address this for disk one, this thing was uh, retried. And there wasn't any other error. It just it encountered an error. It's like, oh, there's an error, there's a retry. Again, if you see one of these occasionally, not a big deal, but this is concerning because as an SSD ages and starts to die and be a little bit more problematic, before it goes hardcore problematic, you'll start to see more and more of these kinds of events in the event log, in the event viewer. Sometimes these are PCIe bus errors, especially like the Samsung uh, SSDs when their PCIe 4 SSDs first came out, they needed a firmware update to properly work with PCI Express 4. So this is something you can look for in the Windows event log and you can sort by source disk and, you know, get a pretty good idea over time. So this one, you know, was a few days ago, but you can go really far back in time, depending on, <laughs> depending on when your machine was installed. The Windows event log goes back to the beginning of time. This is just a primer on the Windows event log. There's actually a lot to learn here, uh, but this is sort of the, the baseline of what you need to know if you want to take it from here and learn more about the event viewer. A lot of people, a lot of people on our forum, even when we're trying to help them, they don't realize the power of the Windows event log. And they're only kind of vaguely aware that it's there. But wait, there's two more things here 
beyond the Windows event log that's gonna make this a lot better. One big, one little. The big thing here is that while a lot is logged in the Windows event log, there is more that should be logged even for like normal home users. And this video isn't so much about power users, but folks that are handy with tech and just wanna have a little bit more visibility into what's going on in the background on their computers. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can't apply this in the enterprise. You can you know, go to your boss and say, look at all the stuff I've learned about Sysmon, and they'll be excited and happy and, and interesting. But, but uh, if you apply this, it's gonna work fine on your home computer. The other thing that would be nice is if uh, we could log events to another computer, just in case the main computer is uh, not accessible. But that's maybe, a, maybe another video or maybe come to the level one forums. Let me introduce you to Sysmon. Sysmon really probably should be part of Windows. It's lightweight. It's very low overhead, relatively, and it's actually from Microsoft. It's not a third-party utility. It's a utility that lets you peek behind the curtain and see all sorts of interesting stuff that tends to be, uh, you know, there, but not really there. But it leverages the Windows logging facility, and it's surprisingly easy to customize. Inside the kind of security solutions that big companies have, that they pay a lot of money for, they usually implement something like Sysmon, but is actually worse. So. When you want to make your security vendor nervous in your corporation, you can ask them questions about stuff you've learned about how Sysmon works from this video, and uh, that's going to probably be some interesting conversations. Now, installation of Sysmon is really easy for a single desktop machine. You really just have to go to the Microsoft website and download it. And Sysmon is probably already a ubiquitous feature inside your company if you work at a company that's more than 100 people. I mean, look at their webpage. Look at all the cool stuff for Sysmon. Recording of logs, loading the DLL hashes and which DLL goes where, optional logging of network activity, process creation. Let's get this set up and take a look at what it's doing log-wise. Now, by default, Sysmon is going to log a bunch of stuff to the Windows event log, and it's logging to its own Sysmon area. You know, the cool stuff that we see on the Sysmon page. It's up to you to decide what's important, and how you do that is through the config that is the XML file. Uh, it doesn't really come with a good configuration. It's completely open-ended. Fortunately, there is an amazing cheat sheet of a configuration from Swift on Security on GitHub. There's a link below, but this repository and the readme file has plain English, plain language explanations for what this configuration file is, what every line in the configuration file is, and what it's doing. Basically for the different kinds of events like creating a file or accessing something on the network or changing a file's uh, date and time, it has explanations for every single different thing. So let's do the installation. Drop to an administrative command prompt and get it installed. But here's the next magic. Let's open that XML file. So I downloaded Sysmon and I extracted it to C colon backslash Sysmon and then I ran PowerShell as administrator. Now you can install it with dash I and then a config file, and then you can update the configuration with dash C, a config file. It's like, what's the config file? Well, it's an XML file. And this is that cheat sheet I was telling you about. We're gonna download that. I'm just gonna click on this and go to raw, and then I'm gonna use Notepad++ to edit. Now notice when I save this as XML, the colors changed. If you're not familiar with XML, you probably should learn a little bit about XML, but Green is a comment, and the comments, if you read this, this will tell you lots of useful stuff about this configuration file. And it's broken into sections, and it has to do with the event IDs and the type of event filtering that's going on. And so this is a rule group name, it's gonna match or, and so this is telling us in the comment, Sysmon event ID one process creation. If we go back to the web page for Sysmon, then we can see here that there is more documentation, event ID one, process creation, and there's a little bit more information. Process two, process change to file uh, creation time. This is unusual, so when a file is created, it gets a creation time. If something revises the creation time, that is actually very unusual, and this will log that unusual activity. It won't block it, it just lets you know that it happened. Network connections, which happen under you know some circumstances, a Sysmon service state change, so like if it's started or stopped, Process terminated, driver loaded, image loaded, raw access read, process access, file create. This is another useful registry events. Now you're gonna get a lot of noise from registry events unless you turn that off. But uh, you know, it's useful. It's useful to know, especially when you're looking at other stuff. File create, stream hash. There's a lot of other really interesting content that you can look at to do with, uh, <laughs> you know, something happened with the clipboard if you want to log that. But this XML file controls what is included and what is excluded. 
And if you read it, it's almost readable. So like command line condition begins with C Windows WRMGR, the Windows error reporting telemetry. And this is in exclude. So if process monitor sees something from this, it's going to exclude it because it's probably part of the Windows error reporting telemetry and you don't really care about that. If you want to customize this configuration, you can change the XML file and create something here. So here at the end, you can see command line condition begins with Google Chrome application here, you know, Google Chrome massive command line arguments. And this is in, I think this is still in the exclude section. Yeah, so this is in the exclude, sh exclude section. This is gonna be excluded. If you're logging something that you want to exclude, you can basically look at what's here and copy paste the command line and then change it according to whatever's in the event log that you don't want to log. All creation time in the past, there's really not a lot to this. It's maybe normal behavior for task host and MSI exec and trusted installer, because trusted installer will create a file, but the file's from the installer. And so the installer file in the installer has an older date. So it makes sense. Oh, look at that, GeForce Experience. Thousands of events, user profile. It's like, eh, target file name contains this. Like, don't even, don't even log that. So there's different kinds of conditions. Contains, ends with, is, is exactly, uh, or the target file name. So image is the executable. Target file name is the, uh, the, the file that is being affected. And so you can control that. You can control that with, with DNS. We could do a whole separate video on customizing this, but I think if you can read and you have a pulse, you'll figure this out pretty quickly. All right, so I just did the initial installation of Sysmon, but you know, I don't wanna wait around for Sysmon to generate an event. And remember it logs starting and stopping. So I'm gonna rerun Sysmon with dash C config XML. I haven't changed the configuration yet. We will do that. But by doing that, it's going to stop and restart the Sysmon service. In so doing, when we come to the event viewer and we go to Microsoft and Windows, and then Sysmon, we will find that we have a new Sysmon thing that's here. And if we look at it, boom, there's all kinds of stuff happening already. So I'm looking at this and I look at it and it says, okay, MS Edge dash dash type. That's not really recording or logging. Go here and we look at this. What's different? What's different about this? Oh, there we go. So, Edge versus Edge Dev. Ah, the Edge developers have excluded this because it's just too chatty. So let's copy this. And I like to make the changes at the end rather than, than in the sections. So I'm just gonna hop down here to the end. I find that if I do it this way and I make some sort of catastrophic mistake, it's easier to recover because it's like, oh, it's the last thing that you changed. Uh, bonus points if you want to uh, Turn this into a Git repository and keep track of changes to this with the Git version control system. I mean, it is already on GitHub, so that's kind of nice, but don't feel like you have to do that. So I've changed this and let's just make sure I'm gonna relaunch Edge one more time. So we should have a fresh event in our event viewer because I haven't re-imported the configuration. I'm gonna do F5 and refresh this. Let's sort by event ID. Oh yeah, all kinds of process creations. Let's see. 1146, there's that one. Oh, that's the DNS query I want. This one, 42, okay, there's edge again. Let's go to the command line, the administrative command prompt, and let's re-import the configuration XML file. Let's sort by date and time. Like sysmon configuration changed. There's our event for that. Now let's launch edge. There's some stuff happening with edge. And then let's refresh that. And so we have Ah, uh, Identity Helper launched, okay. And Identity Helper there. And there's MS Edge. But notice that this, the command line, is not dash dash type. I kept the dash dash type in here just to show you, hey, this is going to be part of the command line, type equal. So the type equal thing wasn't part of it. So I need to create more rules to exclude this. And notice that these two, because they were launched from Edge, they also have parent image MS Edge. And you can use this as part of your rules as well if you don't want to log anything that Edge is doing. But be aware that people can use Edge, they can weaponize Edge and have Edge do naughty things in the background. So you really gotta 
choose carefully what you want to exclude and what you want to keep. Another cool thing I'll show you is uh, if we go back to Sysmon and we just download it one more time, even through Chrome. Doop -de -doo. We go up here to the top and click download Sysmon. You know, I've got the, the one file. If we refresh this, we will see file stream and file create stream. Chrome created sysmon1.zip. So this is awesome. If you have a, a random file that just randomly showed up on your hard drive, it's like, what, where did this come from? Where, where's this at? Are you doing some malware cleanup and you need to know where it came from? This will help you find it. But it also gives you the MD5 sum and some other stuff. Sometimes malware will download a file and then rename a file and you don't necessarily catch that in the logs. And it's, it's folly to turn the logs up to that level to capture every little detail like that. But these hashes, you can't hide from the hashes. You can also look up the hashes for malware and all that other kind of stuff. So it's, it's really handy. So this is kind of a crash course in Sysmon. I could do an hour long video on Sysmon and all the cool stuff you could do with it. But if you can read the XML, you're basically okay. And actually, I highly recommend watching anything by Mark Rusinovich. Uh, I hope I didn't butcher your name. Uh, because you have no idea how deep the rabbit hole goes and the work that that guy and his team are doing if you have to deal with Windows, it's really pretty awesome. It's pretty indispensable stuff that he creates and publishes and, and does that. He even has a video on using Sysmon to threat hunt malware on his mom's computer wherein he is using Sysmon. That's in the Level 1 Text uh, forum thread below. Now that the events are going into Windows Event Log, the second problem, the smaller problem, is Event Log forwarding. Well, it turns out there's a bunch of different ways to forward your Event Log from one system to another. It's, it's basically a really lightweight HTTP service. I don't really need to cover it in the video, probably. Maybe I could do that in a separate video if you're interested. But you can forward events from the Windows Event Viewer to a remote machine. There are companies that make a, um, a syslog, because on Linux it's called syslog. There are companies that make a third-party syslog agent for Windows that'll sit and monitor the event log and then use the syslog protocol to forward that. I don't actually recommend that. You can do this agentlessly, meaning that you don't have to install anything extra on your machine, and especially not third-party stuff. But know that you can have remote sysmon logging, and that works really well. And that's great for doing kind of a post-mortem on a machine that is otherwise inaccessible. Uh, you can retrieve the Windows event log files from a hard drive that's crashed usually, but I just like having the logs forwarded. There's also a nice security aspect of having the logs forwarded. But again, conversations for another day. And like I say, this is super easy to integrate into Active Directory and across a whole bunch of corporate machines and to manage that config file uh, globally or on a per security group basis. But Sysmon is really underutilized in, you know, if for, for quasi power user um, security. And so I wanted to just basically show what it was and show that there were robust configurations available. I mean, the configuration even has stuff in it for the NVIDIA GeForce experience because it does a lot of weird things with the file system. We don't care about that. We can just exclude that from logging because that's just noise. We want to care about the good stuff. I'm Wendell. This is Level 1. This has been a quick look at Sysmon and all the stuff that goes with that. Be sure to check out that thread on the Level 1 Text Forum. I'm signing out, and you can find me there. Music